But let me ask you to think about some favorite uh, God is amazing stories. Right? I, I, I just I love the reality of singing Amazing Grace this morning as we kind of begin to, to lean in uh, in Nehemiah to an amazing story. But I, I want to start by just getting you to engage in your own minds with other God is amazing stories. That might be a story in the Bible. You know, one of your favorites, David and Goliath crossing the Red Sea. There's all kinds of really good God is amazing stories in the scriptures. Uh, it might be a story that you know from history. Uh, some of my favorite God is amazing stories in history comes from a guy by the name of George Mueller. How many of you have heard of George Mueller? George Mueller was a missionary that served over 10,000 orphans during his life and setting up of many different orphanages, established 117 schools that offered Christian education to over 120,000 students. And wait till you hear this. He did it without asking for money. He just trusted God. It's an amazing man. Listen, it might be a story in your own life, like getting stony obliterated and a healing that comes from that, a healing like we experienced with Deneen a couple of years ago, a, a restored relationship, a miraculous provision. Best yet, maybe even just think about your own salvation this morning, uh, that place and time in which God entered into your life and heart by His Spirit to convict you of your sin and tell you that there was a rescuer in the name of Jesus. And can we just rest there for a moment? I, I often, sometimes, often, sometimes, to be honest, often I get accused sometimes of always kind of pushing the envelope when I preach, right? I just keep, uh, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that, you need to be doing it. So listen, this morning in my weakened state, we're just going to rest in the reality that God is amazing, right? He's just that amazing. Recognize this morning, no matter where you've come from, where you are today, recognize the power of God in your life to do amazing things, miraculous things. Because today, we come to an amazing story. And it's a story that isn't often listed in the top 10 of amazing stories, but I'm somewhat secretly hoping that it makes your top 10 after today. It is found in our ongoing study of the book of Nehemiah. So turn with me to the end of Nehemiah 6. It's on page 402 in your uh, pew Bibles, uh, you can get it on your phone. If you have your own Bibles, that would be great. Hopefully your Bible is beginning to open uh, to this place. Nehemiah 6, uh, verses 15. Start at verse 15. I, I want to remind you uh, that Nehemiah has been called and commissioned by God to return to Jerusalem to rebuild a broken wall. As we've seen, there have been many obstacles, many distractions to the process. But as we come to Nehemiah 6.15... We hear this. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. You don't seem all that amazed. <laughs> Some of you were more amazed that Ohio State beat Penn State yesterday in a game of football, right? Well, well let, me, let me try to help you understand the amazement of the reality. Uh, zip eyes, you knew I was going to include that someplace, right? Sorry. You're not going to listen to the rest of the sermon, are you? It's just, it's just, you're done. Uh, listen, uh, let me help you with the amazement of that story, right? Some review that, that helps us to highlight the, the miracle of the building of this wall. Remember, uh, Nehemiah finds out about the condition of the wall, which is in rubble, in what we would call December. It's the month of Kislev. He, he prays for four months, we learned, before asking King Artaxerxes permission to go to Jerusalem. That would have been about April or the month of Nisan. It would have easily taken a month to travel from where Nehemiah was to Jerusalem to settle in and make a plan for the wall. And we discover here at the end of chapter 6 that the wall is completed on the 25th day of Elul, which is our September. Listen, we're still trying to figure out 
what we're going to do to the old sanctuary, right? Lawrence Hall. And it's been a million months, it seems like, right? And here we have a calling upon Nehemiah's life to go to Jerusalem. There's some delay in all of that. And then all of a sudden, the wall begins to be built. And get this, in 52 days, the wall is completed. And that's just nine months from the moment in which God said to Nehemiah, go rebuild the wall. You still don't seem all that amazed. (laughs) Maybe it's because you don't recognize that this wall was probably two and a half miles long. Eight feet wide, at least. Forty feet tall. And is being repaired in sections by a group of people like Stauffer who can't fix anything. Listen, the miracle of the rebuilding of this wall is incredible. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> ben, I owe you. That's good. My heart be still. Listen, I, I, Nehemiah tells us in this text that even if you're not amazed, his enemies were amazed. The enemies of Nehemiah and the the Jews were were crazy, scared, amazed by what was happening before them. Verse 16 tells us that they fell greatly in their own esteem. (laughs) And that they perceived, listen to this, that the Jews had to have been helped by their God. It was God who rebuilt that wall. These strong nations around Jerusalem realized they are nothing in the hands of the Jews and of their God, and they are afraid. There's a lot of modern day application we could go to right now, right? With the reality of what we see in Israel today. But I would pray, as I did before the sermon, that the reality of what is happening in Israel would be for a result such as this. That the nations would fall in low esteem of themselves because of their perception of the amazing things that God is doing. Amen? Amen. Listen, this story is obviously a story about the amazing power of God to finish miraculously what he started. In in chapter 2, verse 8, as Nehemiah makes an appeal to to return to Jerusalem, he says, the good hand of the Lord is upon me. In 2.18, it's the testimony of the good hand of God that inspired the people to join Nehemiah in rebuilding. In 2.20, Nehemiah proclaims to his enemies, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and they begin to build. In 4.15, Nehemiah gives sole credit to God as the one who frustrated the plans of the enemy who tried to distract them from the building. And then to our text today in 6.16, when even the enemy realizes that the completion of the wall is due to the fact that God had done it. From beginning to end, this has been a project of God Almighty. And I can't imagine the party in Jerusalem, hopefully there are better partiers than you all, (laughs) recognizing the faithfulness of God in the completion of the wall. So first, an encouragement this morning. In your life, know this. God is faithful to complete the things that he has started in our lives. All of us are at some station in our spiritual journey. All of us are at some place in our own lives of trusting or not trusting, of doubting or affirming the reality of who God is. But here's the truth that I know. That God, as he has sent his spirit to you, is going to complete you. And all that he has promised... He will finish because he finishes what he starts. And God is still performing miracles out of the rubble of our lives. Now, I've been privileged to watch as, as broken marriages have been miraculously rebuilt, or to see lives broken by addiction by, be completely changed by the Spirit of God. I've seen miracles in people's health turnarounds. I've even watched miracles, listen, happen through the death of a saint. The people come to faith in Christ as a result of even someone's passing. I don't know where you are this morning, 
what your rubble is that needs to be rebuilt. But I'm trusting that the story of a wall completion gives you confidence in a faithful God to do anything, anything in your life. But I also want to allow that encouragement to lead us to a challenge today. Because the faithfulness of God in Nehemiah's life actually leads to a greater challenge. A greater challenge that we see as we pick up in verse 17 through the first four verses of chapter 7. So 6, 17 through 7, 4. This is the word of God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, and his son Jehonahan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Did you follow that? <laughs> also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes, the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Now, what's going on in these verses? I, it seems ironic to me, right, that, that immediately after the reality of the wall is complete, that God has done this amazing thing, that Nehemiah immediately takes an account of some weird family tree that's going on that brings uh, angst to them. Now, we've heard that the enemies are like falling like leaves in the middle of autumn peak season, right? In the reality of the goodness of God. And yet, Tobiah, a guy that we've heard of before, he's still working at it, right? He won't acknowledge defeat, but instead of acknowledging defeat, he just keeps persecuting the work of Nehemiah. So notice in these verses that though the wall is finished, there is still opposition. Notice also in these verses that there's still a need to be wise in the protection of the city. It's not as if Israel just kind of sat back and go, well, good, the wall's finished, we should be okay. No, ne Nehemiah in verse 3 is not opening the gates until noon. Why? Well, because it would be harder to attack in that moment. There's a reality that they know that there's still an opposition. There's still an enemy. And so they still need to be wise in the reality. When God does something amazing, here's the point. When God does something amazing, he's usually setting up us for more work. <laughs> I know that's the most encouraging thing that you've ever heard, right? But, but I think we need to hear it. It's as if Nehemiah is telling us to be ready to work harder when the thing God has done is complete. And at surface level, that doesn't seem to make sense, that we have to work harder when something is complete. But look at the text. If we expected opposition to stop when the wall was complete, we're mistaken. Tobias has not given up mocking Nehemiah. And, and then here again, that instruction in 7.3, to delay the opening of the gate. Why this instruction? Because even though the wall that is to protect them is finished, yay, Nehemiah is still anticipating an enemy. Opposition. So hear this, the more that we see God do miracles in our lives, often it will correlate this side of heaven with greater challenges. So be ready to work harder when the thing God has done is complete. Let me say that again. Be ready to work harder when the thing God has done is complete. Uh, Jesus, in a parable in Luke 12, uh, tells us similarly, right? It's a parable that's regarding always being ready for the coming of the Lord. So the coming of the Lord is this grand and amazing reality, but the reality is, is that Jesus is saying to his people, but we, we've got to work to be ready. And the conclusion of that parable is in verse 48. Jesus says this. It's a verse that you know. Everyone to whom much was given, 
of him much will be required. You hear it? Everyone to whom much was given, to, to the miracle of life has been given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. We, we will find this to be the truth of the story of Nehemiah. So hint, Nehemiah, after this point, doesn't finish the wall. Go back to being a cupbearer, saying, man, glad that's over. Wall built, we're good. No, listen, one miracle leads to another, but with great responsibility. In fact, if you look at the rest of chapter 7, you'll see the responsibility that lies before Nehemiah. And I'm not going to read it. It's about a jillion names and numbers with regard to those who have returned to Jerusalem. Aren't you glad that I'm not going to read it? But let me skip to the end, verse 66. The whole assembly together was 42,360 people, besides their male and female servants, of whom were 7,337. And they had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Now, here's what's interesting that Nehemiah puts that in. It, it's actually this very same listing with the very same numbers that we'll find way earlier in Ezra. So what I don't think Nehemiah is saying is now that the wall is built, all these people are coming back. Because these 50,000 so people are already there. In fact, they're among the people who are actually rebuilding the wall. But I don't know about you, but gathering 50,000 people that left everything to come back to Jerusalem and live in the rubble, there's going to be issues. I mean, there's only 300 of you, and oh, we deal with issues all the time. <laughs> do, do you hear it? Do you hear the challenge that Nehemiah has? Yeah, the wall's done, but oh, now you need to build a nation. And here are the 50,000 people and the 6,720 donkeys that I've given you to do it with. Wow. I don't know, if I'm Nehemiah, I said, give me another wall to build, right? Give me another wall. To build. I'll build 15 walls before I have to deal with all these people. There are not homes within the city. We need to build the homes. We need to build an infrastructure. We need to build a way to get along with one another, to care for one another, and, and to accomplish the things of God. This is Nehemiah's next challenge. Yes, God did a miracle, but Nehemiah is quickly in a place that says, I need another miracle in building a nation. So hear this as Nehemiah did. I'll be ready to work harder when the thing God has done is complete. And in that, I want to encourage you again with a gospel truth. A gospel truth. Throughout our study of Nehemiah, we've seen that much of what we discover in the story is actually foreshadowing the story of Jesus. And this truth of an amazing completion that leaves a compelling challenge is no exception. So stick with me here, right? I want you to hear this for your own life. The story of spiritual rubble, the story of spiritual rubble began in Genesis 3. With man rebelling against God, humankind was left in total defeat. We were in rubble. But God made a promise in Genesis 3 that he would rebuild his people from that rubble. And the entire Old Testament is a story, like Nehemiah is a story, that points to the rebuilding of God's people. And we see that story come to its height in the person and work of Jesus, the very one that, that God promised would come to restore us and rebuild us, even when we were left totally, listen, totally incapable of rebuilding ourselves. The scriptures do not say that we were sick in our sins. It doesn't say that we were infirmed in our sins. It doesn't say that we were debilitated in our sins. It says we are dead in our sins, incapable of rebuilding ourselves. But here comes Jesus. And fast forward to when Jesus hung on the cross and he cried, it is finished. Listen, he was not talking about his physical, earthly life. Rather, he was talking about the work that was begun in Genesis 3. 
He died on that cross and cried, it is finished, because at that moment, God, listen, completed the work that he promised in Genesis 3 of setting you and I, us, free from sin, of rebuilding his people. Without Jesus, our lives are in shambles. But God does a miraculous rebuilding. He sends his son to earth to live obediently, to die sacrificially, to rise victoriously, so that we might be rebuilt. This is a miracle, and it's a reason today for you who are in Christ to party. But does this mean we can sit back, relax, till Jesus comes back? Does this mean that I'm always going to have money in my pocket, health in my soul, I'm always going to have everything good, everything's going to be great, like I become a Christian and man, everything is peachy. Let me answer that question for you. No. Listen, the, the miracle's been done. Jesus has died for your sins. He completed it. It's done. You're going to heaven. But hang on. There's a greater challenge to be faced. There's opposition that's going to come. And we need to be prepared for that battle, church. Maybe you're here this morning and you still feel like you're lurking among the rubble of your own broken life. And I have good news for you. God wants to do a, a miracle in your life this morning in about 5.2 seconds. He wants you to know today that when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, that he said that for you. You no longer have to walk among the rubble of the fear of sin. Rather, you're forgiven. Your sin has been paid for. You've been rebuilt. And if you trust that today, heaven joins us in a party on your behalf. But listen, as Christians, we must realize that though we've been rebuilt, there still will be Tobias that come against us. We still need to use wisdom and hard work in our journey as one who has been rebuilt. In fact, in light of this text, can I just leave you with one compelling question? The question is this. Be beyond our salvation, what is it in our lives, in our spiritual journey, that we are trusting God to do because we couldn't do it without him? Like the rebuilding of the wall. I, I don't know how those Jews felt when they, 52 days later, and they all looked and they went, <laughs> the wall's complete. Like, how did that happen? Is there something in your life that you're trusting God for simply because you know you don't have the ability to do it? It really is a full circle question. We started the sermon, God is always faithful to complete what he starts. And while we are to keep on plugging, the truth is we should be yearning for things in our spiritual journey that only God can do, that we will continue to see the faithfulness of God to do it for us. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you what you have done in your life that you are grateful to God for. Sort of like the running back who runs into the end zone and points to the sky, right? I mean, what is it in your life that you have had to be dependent on God for to complete? Notice, the enemies of Nehemiah did not reflect on Nehemiah's amazing ability to lead or the people's dedication to the effort. Rather, they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of their God. In other words, that wouldn't have gotten done without the intervention of God in it. And I'm asking us this morning to think, what is it in my life that is noticeably being accomplished only by the help of God. Heck, I'll put you all in a category. What's happening at Covenant Church that only God could do? What have we trusted God for here that we know we can't do in our own power, in our own strength, but that we lean wholly into God to do? A bit of a truth bomb, maybe, for us all. We don't need God to help us maintain the church. We don't need God to help us maintain the things in life that we have created. Oh, but listen, 
We do absolutely need God to accomplish the things that he has called us to that are way outside our abilities. It became very obvious to Nehemiah that he, he didn't need God to be a cupbearer to the king. But to rebuild a wall in 52 days, that would need the intervention of a mighty God. And what did Nehemiah choose? What is it in your life that you know you need God to accomplish? And are you pursuing it? What is it, church, that we need God in order to accomplish? Are we willing to leave our maintenance mode to risk everything on what God wants to do miraculously through us? Because it doesn't take God's intervention to run a church as a business, but you better believe it takes God to orchestrate a movement where lost people are getting saved. It doesn't take God to come to church but we are absolutely dependent on God to fully worship Him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't take God to live a life that walks through the motions, but we need God to live out the fruit of the Spirit. And our enemy, the devil, our Tobiah, he's not afraid of a church business, a perfect attender, or a moral person who walks through the motions. But get this, the devil is scared to death of a movement to see lost people saved, to see sacrificial worshipers and lives that are filled with the Spirit of God. What is it in your life that you know you need God to accomplish? And are you willing to pursue it as Nehemiah did? Because here's good news. When we trust Him for the things we can't do ourselves, God makes this promise. He won't fail. He won't fail. I told you I like George Mueller. I'll end with one of my favorite George Mueller stories. He was working in one of his early orphanages, George Mueller was, and quite frankly, there was nothing to serve the kids for breakfast. But he gathered the 50 or 60 kids that were in the orphanage into the dining hall, and like any other morning, even knowing that there's nothing in the kitchen, he said grace. God, I thank you for the food that we were about to partake. You with me? Knowing that there's no food. And we bless your name for your rich provisions. And some simple prayer in that regard. As soon as he was done praying, there was a knock at the front door. He opened the door, and there was a baker holding dozens of loaves of bread. And he said, I don't know why, but when I was baking this morning, I just felt like I should bring some to you all. And right behind him was a milkman with all of this milk. Why? Because the milkman's truck broke down, right, right in front of the orphanage. And in the 1800s, you needed to use the milk pretty quickly, right? And so all of a sudden, George Mueller opens his door, he allows the bread to come in, he allows the milk to come in, and they had a bountiful breakfast in which they gave thanks to God. He couldn't orchestrate that, but he prayed as one who believed that God would. There's much in our lives we can't orchestrate. Oh, but how we need to pray, believing in a God who can.